Well, we are very grateful for the generosity and support of some very wonderful friends of Emmanuel today, Dr. Calvin and Mrs. Nancy Ross. The Rosses established this lectureship to honor the memory of Calvin's parents, Walter and Mardell Ross, and to, cre and to create interdisciplinary conversation for effective teamwork among ministers, students, educators, laity, medical practitioners, and peace and justice advocates. Nancy is a retired professor from Milligan College. Calvin is a past professor and dean at Emmanuel, retired chaplain at the Johnson City Medical Center, and was instrumental in launching the local chapter of Family Promise, a community-based response to homeless families in the area. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ross to the podium to introduce the lecture, spe the lecture speaker this morning. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate that. I want, first of all, to uh, thank the uh, lectureship committee here at Emanuel. Uh, that would be uh, uh, <clears throat> Kip Belolia and uh, Jack Holland and our student intern, Marissa Levan. I also want to thank uh, Lee Fearball and her communications department at uh, Milligan for their help in, uh, <clears throat> in publicizing the lectureship. And I want to thank you, each one of you, uh, for coming uh, this morning when it's a little bit dreary outside <clears throat> for uh, what I know will be a wonderful experience with um, <clears throat> Dr. Colvett. One of the objectives <clears throat> of the Ross Lectures is to build a bridge among the key educational institutions in our area, Milligan College, Emanuel Christian Seminary, <clears throat> and ETSU. Specifically today, I think we have the opportunity to raise a few important girders of that bridge that uh, <clears throat> will better connect Emanuel Christian Seminary and uh, <clears throat> Quillen School of Medicine. No one in this region or in any region by professional practice or personal beliefs is more qualified to speak on the issues of faith and medicine than our speaker this morning. During my 17 years of chaplaincy and uh, serving as um, ethicist for Mountain States Health Alliance, I had the opportunity in uh, the hallways and around the uh, coffee <clears throat> pot in the uh, kitchenettes at the hospital and just in, in informal conversations to hear informal reports from healthcare providers, nurses and therapists and other chaplains about uh, the physicians that were in our MSHA community. And I heard repeatedly uh, the name Dr. Colbert, always in high praise. And it became, even before I met Dr. Colbert, it became very um, obvious to me that he was well respected in that community. And I see that among the, <clears throat> the woodland of physicians, if we, if we might use that image, uh, in the tallest timber uh, stands Dr. Colbert. You see some of that stature in his bio, which is in the uh, bulletin. <clears throat> I'll not go through it uh, extensively, but uh, I will point out his MD from Quillen College of Medicine, his residency training at uh, Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital, the author of uh, over 40 uh, articles in, um, <clears throat> and text, uh, textbook chapters, and he holds a clinical professorship at ETSU. In addition to this, Dr. Colvett has chipped away at an MDiv degree. <clears throat> he mentioned at Harvard and at Harding, but he's not completed that yet. So <clears throat> after the lectureship, I'm going to talk to Dean Ramsaran about maybe enrolling Dr. Colvett so he can complete that MDiv program. 
We're also pleased to have uh, Mary Colvett here, uh, Kyle's wife. I met, I saw her earlier, but uh, Mary, okay, it's got waving her hand there in the corner. Welcome, Mary. Among all of the measures of uh, Kyle's medal, perhaps uh, the most impressive uh, to many of us who are parents is to notice that Kyle and Mary are, are the parents of six children. <laughs> Count them, one, two, three, four, five, six. And uh, that's very impressive that they, uh, they, they have individual unique regard to the giftedness of each one of their children. So we look forward to uh, hearing Dr. Uh, Kyle's lecture this morning and uh, tomorrow and Thursday. His uh, title this morning is Metaphor and Medicine, How Our Language Can Affect Healing. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kyle Colvett. I'll keep my eye on the window for all of you, uh, and if uh, inclement weather arrives, I'll be the first to run out the door and just follow me, and that'll be the way we'll know that. I'm, I'm very grateful to Emmanuel uh, for the invitation. Uh, I consider Emmanuel a wonderful treasure in our community, to have a community of scholars and students dedicated toward concerns about scripture and ministry is something that not all communities can claim. Uh, but more importantly, it's a, a confessional community, a community that's concerned about relationship uh, to our Creator and to His creation. Um, and I'm delighted that the presence of Emmanuel uh, and the people here make my home a better place to live. And I'm grateful for that presence uh, that you have here. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to, to Calvin and Nancy for their kindness uh, in the invitation. And I. Uh, uh, worked well with Calvin for many years in parallel uh, at the hospital. I'm a big fan of Calvin. It's the only sense I might be considered a Calvinist is that I, I care for him. Uh, and, and, and if that's a bad joke, there'll be many more to come. Uh, uh, so, uh, so today we'll, we'll have a chance to, to visit with you. We'll have some time for questions later if something uh, triggers that concern in you. And I'll look forward to meeting you uh, throughout the week uh, in, in time for discussion uh, that we have here. Uh, my father-in-law is a retired uh, scholar, a retired academic fellow. Uh, law and business uh, were his areas of focus. He was an itinerant uh, professor at several institutions. And one of the stations he had was uh, at one of the branches of the University of Texas. And there they had a very unusual policy uh, that they did not allow uh, the departments of that university to branch into tribes. So for your office space, you would not have a geneticist next to a geneticist next to a geneticist. But you might have a botanist next to a historian uh, next to uh, a chemist. And, and the intention behind that was uh, dual. Uh, one uh, is that it fostered uh, a community, community spirit in that institution, that they, they knew one another across disciplinary lines. Uh, but it also created a dialogue that's quite different than what happens when we retreat to our own. Uh, we tend to fall into jargon, and we tend to fall into rote ways of understanding things, but by being required uh, to communicate and share and, and uh, to, to dialogue with people who are different from you creates a, a synthesis, a, a nexus of, of information that, that makes the better in the academic environment. And so in that sense, I'm very pleased to be contributing my own voice to a dialogue between the medical community and the, the uh, spiritual scholarly community uh, in, our, in our region. And I hope that we can continue to foster that through uh, the events of the week, but an ongoing relationship to gather. Now, we, uh, if I hit the right button, tell me. There we go. All right. The uh, lectures this week, they'll be uh, today, uh, tomorrow evening, and we'll have a, a, a map to show you in just a bit, is in Johnson City at what's called the uh, Robinson Clinical Educational Building in the Vota Auditorium there. It's just across the state of Franklin from Johnson City Medical Center, uh, and that'll be at 7 p.m. I'll be talking about uh, an idea of 
of worthless physicians, an indictment from the book of Job on his comforters and the implications it has for us as we hope to be comforters for people in our own lives who are suffering. Particular analysis on what uh, the crisis in health might have on someone's faith and the doubt that can arise from that and how we might respond to those circumstances. And then Thursday, we'll be back here at 11. We'll be talking in what sounds kind of wonky and uh, a little too technical, but I'll I'll hope to dissuade uh, that fear. Uh, We'll be talking about the biopsychosocial model that we use in medical care and ask the important question of how do we integrate spiritual concerns into our medical models. And so that will hope to have some resonance, not only for the people in pastoral interest, but people in healthcare as well. Now, metaphors. Metaphors are a part of our communication style. They're inherent in what we do, and they're the stock and trade for physicians and pastors alike. Uh, One of the key skills that we have to try to impart to our medical students is the ability to communicate, to translate from complex information about the human body and disease to the understanding of whoever that person is in the bed or in in the examination room. And there's a real art to that. Uh, to the ability to communicate in ways to allow that person the autonomy and independence to make decisions and to make those as informed as possible. But we use metaphors in our preaching and teaching as well. And they're a wonderful tool for communication that that is a way to, to, to impart complex information in a model, in a construct that an individual can understand. Uh, But at the same time, metaphors can present a pitfall to communication. They can impede what we believe to be clear understanding. Uh, Metaphors are enmeshed in our culture. They are very much a product of the place and the time and the people who communicate with them. And if anyone in the room has ever worked in cross-cultural circumstances, some of the greatest miscommunications that we have or when we believe we are in shared metaphor with someone uh, and we're not. And so those problems arise in medical and in pastoral situations. I'm going to encourage us to develop our ears for metaphor because sometimes they're so inherent and so common we don't realize we're using metaphorical language. Uh, And if we develop our ears to be aware of it, it doesn't mean we toss the use of metaphor out But once we're aware of it, we can hopefully avoid the pitfalls and hopefully sharpen our tools to use them better. When I teach my medical students and residents and fellows, I try to tell them that their first task is to answer the question, what's wrong with me? In other words, it is to communicate in a way that that person can understand whatever it happens to be, whether it's an, an anatomy issue, an injury a disease process, so that they can have ownership and understanding. And that's been part of the practice of medicine for for some time, but it's not universal and it's not eternal. In fact, there was a long period of time in medicine when uh, the the physician was the, the sort of shaman, the wise man that you might go to, and he would impart directions and instructions, and understanding wasn't necessary, merely obedience. In modern medicine, we try to to understand that the the communication of what is wrong with me makes for a better healing environment and relationship. It also makes for better patients. They'll ask more insightful questions. They'll be more likely to follow through with instructions that are made if they understand the why. And it's not irrelevant, however, that medicine was held in higher esteem in what we call its descriptive era rather than its modern prescriptive era. There was a time when my ancestors in medical practice had very few tools in the box. Uh, The doctor's bag was limited. The pharmacopoeia of the medicines they might use, the surgeries they might perform were very limited. Yet physicians in that time were held in high esteem because they would spend the time to sit at the bedside to hold the hand and to communicate. This is a disease that they'll heal from, or rather this is a disease that will take their life. And in that communication, Uh, describing the diseases and the fevers and the rashes and those kinds of things. Even though they had very little to do about it, physicians were held in high esteem because they communicated. These days, the array of tools in our box is seemingly infinite and changing rapidly. Uh, The medicines that I learned in medical school 20-some years ago, many of them are not even available now. 
And I find that out on an almost weekly basis when I write a prescription for something that doesn't exist. And I'll get a call from a pharmacy technician who is around 14 years old and says, they don't, <laughs> they don't make that anymore. And I go, okay, I, I'm, I apologize. But in our prescriptive area, when we have a thing we can do, an intervention we can propose, a medicine we can prescribe for almost everything, then the relationship becomes transactional rather than relational. It becomes, here's the thing you do, and we've lost the potential for communication. Now, it's not a giant leap to tell you that that can happen in pastoral and ministerial relationships as well. That sometimes what we believe to be communication is happening at a level that is not personal and individual and miscommunication is the outcome. Now, it's interesting to know that the scholars at Emmanuel were called doctors long before physicians were called doctors. The original term of doctor applied to church scholars. And in fact, there are the doctors of the church, people like uh, Aquinas and, and others who were the highest level of scholastic achievement in theology. Um, so the idea of being a, a doctor originally meant a church father, but there's something important there that it comes and is related to the, the verbal etymology about teaching. It's really about communicating. And so the idea of to be a physician is by necessity and ought to be to be a teacher. In some of our teaching and communication, we'll be using metaphor. The traditional idea about metaphor is it's just ornamental. It's a way of fancying up your words to make something be poetic. And so Shakespeare might compare someone to a summer's day. And in that idea of that uh, comparison, it, was, it really didn't offer any change in the communication. But we begin to see now with modern communication theory that, that metaphors both define and reflect the communication. They become the agency of the communication and they color the information that's passed on. So the data that passes through metaphor is not merely ornamented, but transformed by it. And because of that, the metaphor can sometimes take place of the core data that's trying to be communicated. We'll talk more about that. So once again, metaphors permeate our language. Shared metaphors are often very deeply ingrained, and we'll see some examples of those in a bit. Metaphors can become frozen. That's a technical term for once a metaphor is used so often uh, that, it, that it no longer has lability. It's no longer flexible to the situation. It just, this means this. It's a very direct and concrete application. Uh, and metaphors are often invisible to us. So we'll direct our attention, our ears to hear them, our eyes to see them, so that we can begin to realize that they're present. In medicine, there is always a considerable distance between the scientific fact and the patient comprehension. And so metaphors can be a bridge it was completely unintentional that I titled this slide with a metaphor that I called metaphors, a metaphorical language as a bridge. And that's an illustration of how well they permeate how we communicate. So metaphors can communicate critical information that, that couldn't be communicated by didactic means. I couldn't take hours to explain to someone how the brain and the nerves work, but I might use a metaphor of the circuit breaker in their house and the wiring as a way of helping them understand why the problem's in your brain, but it's your fingers that are weak. But likewise, it can be exceedingly difficult to communicate complex ideas about faith and God without the aid of metaphor. And so one of the things that's part of training in a seminary, part of developing those skills, and is, is to finding what are the right metaphors to communicate complicated information. I tell my medical students they need to be collectors of metaphors. When they're sitting down with a, an attending physician who's talking to someone about a complex idea, if they hear something that works and sounds right and brings a face of insight and, and understanding into the patient, save that one. Stick it in your belt because someday, five years from now, ten years from now, you may need to communicate complex information. Preachers and pastors need to be collectors of metaphors as well. Not that you've copied someone else's way of communicating, but if there's something effective, it's okay to borrow that. It's okay to re reuse that and, and utilize that way of communicating. But the complex information in medicine or the complex information about our God and how he's made the world, we use these ways of, of, of passing on the information. Our scripture is rife with metaphor. How do you explain the eternal God of which there is only one example? Well, we try to put it in human terms, and so metaphors that are very common in Scripture, 
God is a king. God is a shepherd. God is a father. God is an aggrieved husband. For instance, the book of Hosea. Uh, Christ is sometimes pictured as a lamb or a priest or uh, in John's gospel particularly, eternal things like light and the word uh, to explain how he's not quite like anything else. So often we are struggle to communicate the truth about God. We are, we're more often describing what he's not. In him there is no darkness at all, or it's impossible for God to lie. So we, we communicate in the negative sometimes because we struggle to communicate what is so critical about uh, God the Father. But you know, sometimes these metaphors don't communicate communicate quite as clearly as we think they ought. We think that they're right on target, but the audience may hear things quite differently. There are enacted metaphors, uh, that's my own term, that might not be an appropriate technical term, but I call them enacted metaphors in scripture. I believe animal sacrifice, much of the practice in Leviticus, baptism and communion are enacted physical metaphors where we're using ideas about burial and resurrection, ideas about uh, birth uh, and, re- and rebirth, in ways of communicating things that are very difficult to communicate otherwise. But these same metaphors uh, that we think are perfect in communication can be a barrier. The king metaphor for God doesn't sound quite the same to people who've lived in a democracy. There's something about a king that's not altogether attractive, not altogether desirable. Uh, And if you've lived in a despotic uh, reign where there's a a dictatorship, the king has even more negative connotations. So we think we're going to talk about God as a king and we'll sing songs about crowning him with many crowns. And to some ears, that's not a welcome sound, that that's not the kind of God that resonates with them or provides a comfort. The shepherd metaphor is pretty good if you're rural. And if you're agrarian, but the more we move away from that, it becomes a distance between the metaphor that we have to explain and explain and explain what that means. Uh, But it's common. We use it everywhere. The very fact that this is called pastoral care lectures is the shepherd metaphor come to life. Uh, The father metaphor is a wonderful one unless you don't have a good father. And increasingly common in our society, there are people who are growing up without a father. The father is merely a biological entity, not a relationship. Uh, And because of that, the father metaphor that sounds like a great thing to emphasize when we're teaching people may not reach the ears of some of our audience in the way that we would like. Good metaphors, useful metaphors, ancient metaphors, but they're not universal in the sense that they uh, always reach the intended point. Now, this is a complete aside, and I will hesitate from pushing too hard on this, but a number of historical Christian schisms have come from when people have disagreed about their metaphors. So in asking, does the Holy Spirit emanate from God or from God and the Son? It's really metaphorical language for things that are impossible to understand, but when one group says it's this metaphor and the other says not at all, that metaphor is entirely incorrect, then the core truth that's trying to be communicated there is dismissed. It's the metaphors that we fight over. And that's been true throughout Christian history. In the same way, some of our disease metaphors that doctors use can actually become barriers. They can be destructive metaphors uh, because they can unintentionally create blame, can create, can stir negative emotions, and they can depersonalize the person. They can make them less human by the metaphors that we use. In the pastoral care of the sick, metaphors are often unspoken. Some of you may be called to the bedside of a sick person and they have already developed a construct of disease in their mind. They have a metaphorical understanding of why that this thing has happened to them. And if you don't recognize that, your efforts to comfort, your efforts to communicate may reach uh, inefficiency at the very least and harm at, at the greater level. So patients have often adopted metaphorical understanding of their disease and it's gonna be critical for physicians and pastors to assess those, to understand them, in order to communicate the way we would like. So metaphor, on the positive sense, can can improve focus and it can allow clarity. So like a, a, a good optometrist gives you glasses that helps you see more clearly, metaphor can help us see more clearly. At the same time, if you pick up your dad's glasses and not yours, it might make the world dizzy. It was a fun activity for me when I was five. 
my, my only experience with significant substance abuse was by my dad's bifocals. Uh, <laughs> so metaphors can distort. And so when the metaphor begins to replace reality, it's not quite what we intended to be. So examples of miscommunication I mentioned earlier are rife in cross-cultural settings, in medicine and in missions. Uh, meanings can change over time, and reassessment is going to be necessary for doctors and, and preachers alike in order to have the right attention to the metaphorical use. I'm going to intentionally choose a disease story to talk to you about this morning, and I'm choosing one with which most of you will be unfamiliar, at least in a direct and personal sense. I was concerned if I chose uh, a modern disease that you're around a lot, you've already got your ideas about how that disease works. So I'm stepping you out of your comfort zone just a bit. And we're gonna use an illustration of a disease story and how metaphor in another culture and another time affected how we understood it. Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is a disease that's an infection. It's caused by a germ that we now call mycobacterium. It's been present in humans since prehistoric times. And there are still places in the world where it is an incredibly common infection and causes a lot of sadness and suffering. It has a number of names. So if you're looking through family history and you find a great-great-grandfather who died of consumption, that was tuberculosis. Or fizzes, which is incredibly hard to say, but that's also tuberculosis. And sometimes called the white plague by the more poetic among us. So it's been present in humans since prehistoric times, but it is largely eradicated in modern United States. That's, that's not an absolute statement, it's still around. Uh, and it had a, a bit of a comeback. It, it had a resurgence in the 1970s and 80s, uh, whereas in the 50s we were quite optimistic we'd completely gotten rid of it. Uh, so tuberculosis has been around for a long time, but there was a particular time in human history when tuberculosis became the critical and most common disease among people. So in Europe in the 1600s to the 1800s, that was the reign of tuberculosis. That was the time of the White Plague. It caused the most widespread public concern. 80% uh, of all Europeans were infected by the tuberculosis germs. And of those who developed what we call active tuberculosis, 80% would die. Uh, in 1815, one out of four of, of every death in England was caused by tuberculosis. And by the end of World War I in France, still one out of six deaths were caused by TB. It's very difficult for us to imagine a disease that that's, that's that common and that deadly. It's distant from us, though, so we don't have our minds made up much about how to describe it and how to understand it. We do have some modern conceptions of tuberculosis, but it's distant from us. So how is this disease perceived metaphorically by the people? Well, it turns out that it became associated with young and creative people. How did that happen? Well, tuberculosis is a, is a disease of infection where people in close quarters, like cities and, and the less clean environments, can become infected. So country boys and girls who lived in the rural areas, either because they were farming or maybe they were uh, the, the well-off landowners, when they moved to the city, they did not have immunity to TB. They hadn't been infected as a child. And they get to the city where there's close quarters and tuberculosis runs rampant. So the social image, the cultural image of TB was young, healthy people who've moved to the city to seek their fortune. They're creative, they're writers, they're musicians, they're scholars and students. And that's where they get tuberculosis. And so it became known as a disease of artists and poets. Now, when it's true that one out of four deaths is caused by TB, there's not one out of four artists and poets, but that's, the reality was different from the metaphor, the cultural understanding of this condition. And people actually believed that your creativity and your artistic skill rose the sicker you got. So the more weak you became or the more affected you were by the disease, the more ethereal you became, the more otherworldly in your skills and your ability. So among the victims, it is an honor roll of the greatest writers, artists, and musicians of the 18th and 19th century. Elizabeth Barrett Browning, Robbie Burns, Camus, all three Bronte sisters, Chekhov, Stephen Crane, Guy de Maupassant, Kafka, Keats, and on and on the list goes. So these talented people, people of great skills, who died young from tuberculosis, that became the face of the disease. And the metaphors for tuberculosis was, it was a disease that manifested 
with physical symptoms that made the person more uh, otherworldly, uh, more, more holy almost, we might use. So symptoms that to an objective observer sounds like this person's really sick. They're pale and they're thin and they're weak. To a subjective view is, look how beautiful they've become. They're thin and their, their skin is so white and uh, how their eyes sparkle and they've got a blush to their cheeks. Well, that's fever. Uh, but the idea and the notions of this disease became the associations with it. So there's the Bronte sisters in a, in a famous uh, crayon drawing. And, and there was a slow progress of tuberculosis. In a time when people died quickly from things, having a disease that killed you relatively slowly over a few years was associated with a good death. So a bad death is, is you're perfectly fine and you're struck with something and you're dead in a few days. But a good death is something that you die just as dead, but you die slowly and you have a chance to communicate the things that are important to you. There is, by the way, still such an idea as good death, but this was the metaphor associated with TB. And so it became to represent spirituality, creativity, and even wealth. And it was the young bohemians that were the face of tuberculosis. Tuberculosis was the height of tragic beauty. Uh, and the romantic melancholy ideal of the time. And so it was a fashionable mark of distinction to have the pallor of a TB patient. And so if you were healthy, your makeup would be to create that exceedingly pale appearance because that is the kind of ethereal and spiritual person you wanted to present yourself to the world to be. And so things like rouge and coloring began to be abandoned and they used things like powders and chalk and arsenic, which wasn't a good idea. Uh, <laughs> to make their skin white. So tuberculosis was romanticized. Uh, and so many of the, the great works of art from that time, like uh, Puccini's La Boheme uh, or uh, Verdi's La Traviata had heroines or, or heroes who were dying of TB, how beautiful they were. Mo some of you may know that La Boheme was updated a few years ago in a Broadway musical called Rent and the disease was changed to HIV or AIDS. Same story, more or less. Uh, and the idea of the romantic disease uh, was translated to a modern circumstance. And we'll talk a bit about AIDS in a little while. And so Le Miserable and Nicholas Nickleby had heroes with TB. So the metaphor of TB is creativity. Elizabeth Barrett Browning, in a, a, a shriek of, uh, of sexism, was accused that her genius of writing must have only come from her TB. Uh, a term for it was scrofula, a particular kind of TB. And she overheard some jealous people saying, is it possible that her genius is only the scrofula? In other words, it's the disease that's making her creative, not anything inherent in her. This is the reputation that it had. John Keats, famous painting that you don't get much more pale than Johnny Keats there. Um, he contracted tuberculosis while caring for his brother who died of TB. He died at 26 years old, tragically at a very young age. And in a letter to his uh, fiancée, Fanny Braun, he said, It's certain I shall never recover if I am to be long separate from you. I am literally worn to death, which seems my only recourse. You uh, are to me as an object intensely desirable. The air I breathe is empty. That's empty of you is unhealthy. Well, his air was unhealthy. Uh, it wasn't the absence of Fanny that made it that way. But here is the tragic lover dying from his longing for his lover, not from the infection in his body. Lord Byron, uh, always a, a prominent fellow, says that I should like to die of consumption because the ladies would all say, look at that poor Byron, how interesting he looks in dying. George Sand said about her lover, Frederick Chopin, Chopin coughs with infinite grace. <laughs> what an observation to make about a disease that's killing people, but the metaphor has replaced the obvious thing that these are people dying of a horrible illness and an infection. It is a beautiful disease. It is a disease that when you contracted it, this was the way you communicated to one another. Aubrey Beardsley, an interesting uh, British writer, says that I'm so affected, even my lungs are affected. That's going to be a little hard to see projected here, but these are some quotations from some 19th century medical textbooks. Uh, they tended to be a bit more flowery in their writing than we are today. It says, in contrast to the diseases of the crude and baser organs of the body, which clog and soil the mind, the imagination and the very humors of the sick, as though with corrupt matter, physis or, or tuberculosis, this illness of the lofty and noble parts, 
of the human being calls forth in the patient a state of elevation, tenderness, and love, a new urge to see the good, the beautiful, and the ideal in everything, a state of human sublimity which seems almost not to be of this world. It makes you want to get TB, doesn't it? <laughs> Another textbook says she was wasted almost to a shadow, attenuated to nearly ethereal delicacy and transparency, perfectly motionless and statue-like lay that fair creature, breathing so imperceptibly that a rosebud might have slept on her lips unfluttered. It's a medical textbook, a medical textbook, talking about people with tuberculosis. The metaphor for TB went away, though, when we learned to get rid of it. When you had nothing you could do about it and you died from it, this metaphor functioned in society, although to us it seems ridiculous. It seems so bizarre to describe a deadly infectious disease in these favorable and, and almost desirable qualities. So once we learned about things like sanitation and cleaning up and later people would discover there was a particular germ that's causing this and then later uh, we would develop ways of treating it with medications, tuberculosis lost all of this metaphorical use in our language. It became a disease of the poor. It became a disease of the dirty. It became a disease of the urban blight and it became a disease of the other. It's those people who have TB, not us. Susan Sontag in 1978 wrote a very seminal book called Illness as Metaphor. She had been diagnosed with breast cancer. At that time, uh, in medical parlance, uh, there was a concept of uh, a cancer personality, that there was something inherent in your uh, mind, your psychology, your behavior that made you more likely to get cancer. And so the very first appointment that was made for her after her biopsy showed that she had breast cancer was with a Freudian psychiatrist. Not with a surgeon, not with a cancer specialist, but with a psychiatrist. That's the first thing that she was sent uh, to, for her care. And she challenged in this book, Illness as Metaphor, the blame the victim mentality because she said the metaphors we were using for cancer were destructive. And she drew similarities between the, the, the way we treated tuberculosis in the 19th century and the way cancer was treated in the 20th century. So there was this idea of a cancer personality. It was called type C personality. I'm grateful that's been thrown to the ash heap of history, but it was very common at that time. Uh, and so they believed that people brought cancer on themselves by being resigned, repressed, and inhibited. So if TB was a disease of the expressed emotion and creativity, cancer was a disease of the internalized, everything's kept inside and it eats away at you. And the best way to treat the cancer was to somehow find out what's eaten away at you psychologically, and that's how we'll manage this disease. This was a horrible metaphor for cancer in the 1960s and 70s. Um, and she showed uh, that these romantic ideas for TB and the character caused things for cancer uh, ended up being negative metaphors. They, they didn't promote the healing process. They were barriers to the healing process. Her treatise was angry. Uh, she updated it later with discussions about HIV. Uh, and she argued that me metaphors ultimately were always negative, that we should always speak in frank, direct terms. I don't entirely endorse her point of view, but I understand where it came from. I understand the, the emotion behind it. So she updated this in the 1980s uh, in the AIDS epidemic and she used the, the metaphors around AIDS. Most of us in the room are old enough to remember when that was a brand new disease. It was a new idea. It was called the, the gay cancer. It was called a plague. And it was very openly spoken of as a judgment from God. Uh, and, and there was also an element, I believe, of racism in it because AIDS came from the dark countries where black people lived, like Haiti and Africa. And it was a disease of the other, not a disease of human beings, but that somehow this terrible blight had been brought into good society by bad people and bad people who were misbehaving. And so because the, the lives of those earlier known victims of HIV disease were purported and reported popularly to be uh, lives of, of dissipation, lives of wild abandonment of any kind of morals. This was obviously direct judgment. And people quoted scripture and preached from their pulpits the idea that AIDS was a metaphor as God's punishment. Uh, I hope that our society has moved beyond that, but it's not entirely true.
Uh, there are still public statements made. There are still people who are otherwise intelligent uh, members of our, our community who say things uh, that are uh, blaming and using the metaphor of AIDS as a punishment from God rather than a virus. Uh, so Sontag said that everyone who is born holds dual citizenship in the kingdom of the well and the kingdom of the sick. And I really like that imagery uh, because when you're in the kingdom of the well, it's hard to understand the kingdom of the sick. And when you're in the kingdom of the sick, it's hard to remember what it's like to be in the kingdom of the well. But we're citizens of both. We just happen to be residing in one or the other at a different time and place. She said her point was that illness was not a metaphor in the most truthful way of regarding illness, the healthiest way of being ill was to be purified and resistant to metaphorical thinking. So is metaphor necessarily bad? Her idea that we should abandon metaphor, uh, but perhaps I think it's better that we be conscious that metaphor exists, to have our ears attuned and our eyes to know that we're using these languages. And if it becomes negative, we, we begin to be adding weight to the metaphor rather than the truth, that we abandon the metaphor, or at least adjust it to the circumstances of the people we're meeting with. Let's consider uh, now a contemporary metaphor, not a disease of the 18th and 19th century, but a disease that's very common today, cancer. Even the very name we have for this disease is a metaphor. It's called from the name of a crab because surgeons recognized that this uh, tumors that they operated on seemed to have little claws that reached out from where it began. And so the, the very name itself is a metaphor. Somewhere around 40% of us will be diagnosed with cancer at some time in our lifetime. That's how common cancer is in North America in our current generation. These days, we cure about 65% of people diagnosed with cancer. Still a horrible disease that kills more people than any other disease except heart disease. And as we've gotten better with heart disease, cancer may strip past heart disease by 2020 or 2025 as the leading cause of death in America. So this is not a remote culture. This is not something in the past. This is a disease that's around us all of the time. Do we use metaphors to talk about cancer? You bet we do. Here's the pitch. This is a battle and I'm the general. To fight this enemy, we can't be timid. And I'm going to kill you. Every day I'm going to kill you and then I'm going to bring you back to life. We're going to hit you with chemo. We're going to bombard you again, then again. You're not going to be able to walk we're practically going to have to teach you how to walk again after we're done. A direct quote from the physician of Lance Armstrong, diagnosed with stage four non-seminomatous germ cell tumor that spread to his bones and brain and other organs. Medically, we know that his chances of being cured was about 40%. So it's remarkable that he was cured, not miraculous in the sense of statistics or anything of that sort. What is more remarkable is that he was able to return to a high level of athletic competition, although we've learned subsequently he had some extra assistance. <laughs> how could, how could a, 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 a well-trained, we presume kind, we presume moral physician walk into a room and use that kind of language for a sick person who's frightened? How could that happen? There's a shared metaphor in our society that cancer is to be treated with military words. Argumentative, fighting, aggressive, violent words. In the 1930s, headlines in the newspaper said, we're going to approach the battle against cancer. That was the, the public rallying cry, that we're going to battle cancer. We're going to combat it. Hear the words? Uh, in the 1970s, Nixon declared war on cancer, like a number of our other declared wars uh, of that era and subsequent. It didn't turn out to be what anyone intended to be. But using the idea of war on cancer was a shared metaphor. Everyone says, yes, that's what we want to do. We want to battle it. We want to fight it. And so military words in the metaphor crept in to the point that when you see a person with cancer, they're going to use those words. It's not a choice that they made. They didn't sit down and choose a metaphor to think this is the way I'm going to talk about my cancer. It's in our culture. And I'm here to tell you that it's not a good metaphor. It's not a functional metaphor. It's not a metaphor that promotes healing and understanding. Almost every media story about cancer uses the idea of war. There's time and fortune, war on cancer. Uh, even our advertisements for chemotherapy medicines, 
Do not ask me why these are in things like Time and Ladies Home Journal. I don't think they should be, but they are. Uh, so ADS4, a chemotherapy medicine, has someone with a sword. She's obviously uh, less military and more competitive, but there's imagery there being communicated. She's fighting with something sharp. It's a violent metaphor. Uh, in that same website for Doxel, uh, you can play a video game. It's not a very good game, by the way. There are other games. Uh, but you can, with your little epee, your little uh, sword, can you know, stab cancer cells with your uh, mouse uh, to show how you're fighting away the cancer with this chemotherapy drug. Arimidex is a, a drug used for, for breast cancer, and their symbol is boxing gloves. They're pink boxing gloves, but they're boxing gloves uh, for, for fighting. The American Cancer Society has uh, their caduceus turned into a sword. And in fact, their motto for a number of years was there's nothing mightier than the sword. So the violent metaphor is so present, we don't even hear it, we don't even see it. And when we talk to sick people, they're going to adopt that metaphor as well. You can go to Barnes & Noble, or I guess Amazon would be less effort, uh, to uh, find the Cancer Battle Plan uh, a book. But what does that mean? What does that mean for me, who's a cancer doctor, if the metaphor that my patient, whom I've never met, who comes into the office to meet me for the first time, already sees me as this guy? My relationship as a healer is inhibited by that metaphor. They already perceive me as someone who is in charge. That's an old idea about doctors. Someone who's going to give orders and someone who is to be obeyed. And while at home, that's a nice thing. In the office, that's not what I want. That's for my children, not my wife, by the way. Uh, so what does that mean about your body? That means your body can become a battlefield in this metaphor, and people are willing to accept physical trauma to their body that they might not otherwise accept because they believe that's what's necessary. Big operations and scars and loss of body parts. There's not a big difference between the walking wounded of a post battle and the walking wounded of a hospital sometimes in that regard. They're willing to accept horrible side effects sometimes because the idea and the metaphor is, is we're battling and there's going to be injuries and there's going to be collateral damage and that's just what happens in a battle. What about cure? What are we accomplishing sometimes? When the violence of the events are such that what's left over in the reconstruction and the rebuilding is a very different life than was there before. What if someone's afraid? Do you tell your, your children, do you tell your spouse that you're afraid of the operation? Well, what does that make you? That makes you a military deserter because we're battling cancer, right? That makes you a, a coward. And so you don't communicate it because the metaphor that we share is we're battling and we're fighting, and we're brave soldiers and we're pinning medals on our chest. But the reality of the metaphor is, is it inhibits an open and frank communication. And if someone chooses not to pursue a treatment, which may be within their right, it may be wise, it's certainly their autonomy to make a decision that's right for them, they should not have the metaphor hang extra weight on them that they're a person who is unpatriotic or a deserter of the war that they should have fought. We talk about bravery. We talk about... Uh, battling. And in this war metaphor, disease is the enemy, the physician is the commanding officer, the patient is the battleground. And we use words like this, he's a real fighter. I hear that almost every day. Someone comes to me from Stony Creek and they have an advanced cancer that we tell them it's really something we can't fix, we're going to focus on controlling symptoms. But you don't understand, Doc, I'm a real fighter. It's a desirable quality. It's, it's a communication of how, 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 of how they perceive themselves, but it's wrapped up in this metaphor that rather than another approach to the disease that might be the, the appropriate one, they're a battler, they're a fighter, as if that's the ultimate and most desired quality. It's not always true. I hear doctors say this. I treat my patients aggressively, and I know what they mean, but it comes across to my ears as something that's not the way I want to treat anyone. Uh, aggressively. What they mean is, is they're more likely to offer treatments when others might not. That's not a desirable quality in your doctor necessarily, by the way. And, and it will hear people say, we can't retreat now once a decision has been made toward a cancer treatment. And let's say that that first choice is not working. Rather than admit, all right, we've tried something and pushing harder has little reward, there's this idea that we've committed. 
And so uh, it doesn't take long for us to understand actual military events where we've committed to a fight and now we can never, ever leave. Well, that's what happens in medicine and cancer care sometimes, too. Uh, these are actual people, but it's public domain. These are obituaries of people who've died of cancer. And when someone dies of cancer, they don't die of cancer. They die after a long battle with cancer. No one ever just dies of cancer. In the obituaries and in the communication we use, the language we use, our metaphor is they died of a long battle or a brave battle with cancer. The onion, not to be used in legitimate academic circles, but I can do it because I don't have a boss, had this obituary, local recall local, uh, a local man's cowardly battle with cancer. It's a, it's, a, it's a commentary. It's obviously nothing that would be published, but it's the, the trope, uh, the meme of battling cancer is so present uh, that they could turn it on its head by saying we would never say that, even though the response of individuals is not necessarily anything like that, but we've borrowed the metaphor and we've assumed it. So war metaphors reduce the potential for honest dialogue. We're not talking on the same grounds now because the patient wants, sees me as the commanding officer. He wants his family to see him as brave. They don't want to be cowardly. They're, they're, it promotes excessive and unnecessary treatments. It makes palliative medicine seem uncaring when we're just really controlling symptoms. We're talking about hospice. Maybe the most honest and caring and compassionate thing we can do for someone. But if we're not battling the cancer, well, what are we? We're bad soldiers. Uh, it can deny that death is a natural and inevitable event. It is, in case you haven't heard that yet, it is. Uh, and it pretends that stoicism and her heroism is the preferred demeanor. Someone who cries is cowardly. Someone who's fearful and expresses that is a bad patient. That's not true at all, but this metaphor makes that to be the case. And it causes patients to choose, choose treatments in order to save face. That's a quote uh, from a palliative uh, or a hospice uh, advanced nurse practitioner who I uh, know a bit named Patrice. And she says, how many times have we all heard that someone is called a fighter, a survivor? The rest of us must be wusses, that's her word. How often do we hear our terminology that is inadvertently offensive to an individual or others? If we see advanced illness as a battle, then there is necessarily a loser. The implication is that we have full control over our disease process and even our survival if we just have the right attitude, if we're just brave. There's a this is a dangerous concept and one we shouldn't perpetuate. There is so much out in the world telling us what we're supposed to do so we don't get sick, let alone die. And when we do get sick, we're subtly shunned as having self-created our own suffering. If you just eat blueberries, you won't get cancer. Or if you just take an aspirin a day, you won't get cancer. Or if you, don't, if you just take these 73 different minerals and herbal supplements, you won't get cancer. Did you know sharks never get cancer? Well, she had a type A personality, you know. She, she uh, never ate properly. I told her to eat only organic macrobiotic foods. So what do you expect? And one of my personal favorites, this is Patrice's words, I guess he just gave up. In other words, fighters survive and people who die by necessity were weaker. That's the implication that the metaphor creates. Even if it's not explicitly stated, that's the understanding. So how can folks like us avoid the hazards of inappropriate metaphors? I don't know that we can completely. In all honesty, I've found myself unintentionally sometimes not catching on to the communication. But let's try. Let's make an effort to hear them. Let's make an effort to see them. One of those are, are really good basic interview skills. If you're involved in counseling or if you're taught in medical care, we're taught to things like to name what someone has said, to actually call it by what it is. I hear you using the term battle. What do you mean by that? I hear you using the word aggressive. We mirror it. We sort of reflect back what they said so that it's heard. Uh, we validate it, says, I can understand why you might want to pursue every possible treatment. I can understand that. Can you tell me what your reasoning is behind it? So we explore it, and then we begin to vocalize discrepancies. We poke holes in the metaphor. Every metaphor can be overextended. And so we begin to gently poke holes in the metaphor to see if that understanding carries beyond the metaphor itself into a real depth. 
And then more advanced responses, and this is hard to do, is sometimes you enter into the metaphor. If they've got a metaphorical understanding, then you jump in and say, well, what if there's just more enemy there than us? You know, if, they, if they're using a battle metaphor. Well, what if we're out of bullets? Uh, and, and sometimes that's helpful, and you're not dispelling the metaphor, but you're showing that it doesn't have full extent and validity in all circumstances. You add new information. You go, well, I can understand that, but what we also know is, is that your blood counts are awfully low. You know, those kinds of things that help to frame the information broader. Uh, correct misperceptions and then redirect thought. And finally, sometimes it's necessary to substitute another metaphor, although that can be dangerous uh, because you may be substituting one misunderstanding for another. But at times that can illuminate. At times that can create uh, uh, realization. Let's talk about a chemotherapy decision. There's someone who has a disease, uh, and that disease is uh, called non-small cell lung cancer. It's a kind of common lung cancer. And in this particular patient we're talking about, it is spread elsewhere in the body. Uh, and the options for treatment are nothing. In other words, nothing that's actively fighting the cancer. We focus on pain. If they have an infection, we treat it. We focus on keeping them comfortable. Or a kind of chemotherapy medicine that uh, requires them to go to the doctor's office uh, once a week or so for a few hours, and it will take place for several weeks, and the statistics tell us that they would live on average four weeks longer than if they didn't do any treatment at all. In the kingdom of the well, that's an easy decision. I would never do that. In the kingdom of the sick, sometimes people choose that kind of treatment. And I'm not here to, to criticize too loudly or, or too much depth, but it's not always appropriate to consider treatment. So you hear someone who says, I want to do the chemo, doc. Rather than say, be here next Tuesday, it's appropriate as a physician or perhaps as a pastor or counselor to that person to understand the basis of that decision. Sometimes there is a great misunderstanding. They don't have the right data. Well, I want to do everything I can to be cured. That's not possible with this disease. Well, miracles happen all the time. Statistically, this is not true. And we'll talk at other times about the understanding of the divine in disease. Uh, so we mirror that. We validate their concerns. So we explore it. And sometimes we substitute a metaphor. In this metaphor picture there, what you've got on the right upper uh, is uh, 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 sort of a satellite photo of the eastern United States and a, a weather radar photo. Someone's uh, saying, well, doc, I've had, this is a different patient now, I've had surgery and I had a PET scan and the PET scan's normal, I don't want to do anything else. And because everything was clean, I'm free of the infection. The invader is gone, they're using war metaphor, we fought the enemy and it's gone. And another substitute metaphor might be, well, yes, but the tests and scans that we have can only see so much. There's a limit to the test that we have. Uh, just for instance, if we looked at the weather radar, it might look like it's clear on the East Coast, but that doesn't mean it's not raining at your house. In other words, the, the fine scale of what we can understand from tests like scans is not as precise as the reality. And so there may be an appropriate treatment to be considered for this patient, but their metaphor is they're already behind that. We've won, we've won the battle when it might be appropriate to consider that. So sometimes we need to substitute a metaphor for someone. A couple of other metaphors to mention to you briefly as we're wrapping up. There's the parental metaphor that used to be common in medicine. There was a paternalism where Dr. Marcus Welby knew what was best. And you said, well, Dr. Welby said take the yellow pills and taking the yellow pills. Uh, in this situation, disease is always seen as an external threat or a danger that daddy's going to protect you from. Uh, and the physician is the loving parent. He just cares about you, but you don't need to understand. Just trust daddy and he'll do what he wants you to do. And in this circumstance, the patient is a child. This is still very common. I have lots of people who come to me and say, you do whatever you want, Doc. You do what's best. You know more than I do, Doc. You just take care of me. You love me. You take care of me. And while I appreciate the confidence and faith that another human being puts in what was heretofore a stranger, it's not a healthy relationship because they're not going to be honest with me. They're not going to understand what decisions they're being asked to make or what cost they're being asked to weigh. We used to hear this, and thankfully we don't hear it very often, but it still comes up. Please don't tell her she has cancer. She's too sick to know the truth. Still around, not very common in our culture, very common in other cultures, exceedingly common in other cultures. 
And we don't want him to lose hope. Don't tell him the truth. We don't want him to lose hope. As if hope were the, you know, the mechanism for all beneficial things uh, in that circumstance. This is not uh, a healthy and appropriate way uh, to manage relationships. And in physicians in the room or pastoral people in the room, we don't want that metaphor at all. The engineering metaphor is very common. It can be useful, and I'll admit and confess to using it sometimes. Uh, in this circumstance, disease is a malfunction. A uh, physician is a technician, uh, a mechanic, you might say. The patient is a machine, but unfortunately, it suggests that everything is repairable. I have a 1948 Willis Jeep that hasn't been driven in four years, and I'm not certain that it will. But if I wanted to, if I spent enough money and enough time and replaced every single part so that I had a noun that occupied the same space as that Jeep but was completely different from it, <laughs> I could get that to run. That's not true for a human body. We're not machines. There are things about us that are seemingly mechanical, but we're not eternally replaceable. And so the idea of human as machine and engineering metaphor has its limitations and sometimes can be a negative metaphor. We'll, we'll say things, we all say it kind of half-jokingly, well, he's just in for a tune-up, and you got to fix me up, Doc. That's the uh, Wild West uh, gun smoke way of uh, talking. Uh, and sometimes doctors will say, well, we just need to fix your plumbing. You know, the plumbing here to your heart's a little bit stopped up, and we're going to roto-rooter that out and get that taken care of. And those metaphors might be friendly, and they're not universally bad, but at times they can create a barrier. And the biggest barrier is, is they're depersonalizing. You're no longer a human being with friends and family and a church, people that love you. You're, you know, a bunch of body parts that needs to be poked and prodded and fixed in the right way. And that's not healthy. Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote uh, in his uh, famous novel, Cancer Ward, about a character, Kostoglatov. Kostoglatov had cancer like everyone else in this ward in uh, Soviet Union. Uh, and he noticed in the observations around the ward that uh, the attending doctors, what we would call the professor doctors, had no time for the patients. They were busy snapping fingers and writing orders and making big decisions. But there was one physician, actually what we would call a medical student, a young woman, who took time to talk to Kosta Glotov, ask him about his life, ask him about his, his work, ask him about his family, and as she moved up in the ranks, she became more distant from him, and he begged her. He says, before you get spoiled by it all, before you become a fully qualified doctor, just give me a helping hand as a human being. Don't speak to me in metaphors. Don't speak to me through barriers. Don't speak to me in a way that I can't understand what you say, that I'm clouded with jargon and snowed under with all of your words. But talk to me as a human being. In pastoral care and in medical care, this is the core of what we need to do. Our first responsibility is to answer the question, what's wrong with me? And our second and greater responsibility is, is to see each person as a human being, as a, a, an image of our creator God who deserves compassion, who deserves honesty, who deserves the love uh, that we've been created to show to others.